Okay, so today what we're going to do is we are going to go over a concrete example of a word problem that's done using MATLAB from Chapter 4 of the 2012 edition of the Stormy Attaway textbook. Uh, it's question number 7, and the question says, write a script that will generate a random integer in the range from 2 to 5, loop that many times to, prompt the user for a number, print the sum of the numbers entered thus far, with one decimal place. And then there's some text below it about uh, how this relates to various engineering applications and that sort of thing. But what's really important to see here is that um, there's a breakdown of this question uh, explicitly uh, with these bullet points that you can sort of replicate with just about any word problem that's out there that's well written. Um, and so what, what's been sort of done or pre-processed here, uh, pre-digested, is uh, taking a, what would be a, like a multi-sentence question and breaking it down into its component parts. So we will start with the beginning, writing the script, and we will move on from there. But it's important to point out that uh, with uh, a lot of these textbook problems, it's important to take that sentence or those sentences and break them up into uh, sentence fragments to try and pull out keywords that are related to the programming concepts associated with what's going on. And this is made especially a lot easier these days by having access to search engines like Google, where you can take some of those keywords like print or loop or uh, repeat or, um, you know, those sort of things, integers or floating point or um, a decimal points, and you can put them into MATLAB with the word MATLAB, or sorry, put them into Google with the, mat, the word MATLAB in front of it, and often help screens will show up. But from there, what's important is to take those keywords, try them out in MATLAB, but then when you're writing up the program, write it out in pencil. Use a piece of paper first, write it down on, on, pen, or on paper mm -hmm. with a pen or a pencil, and then write out that script first, try out a couple of variations, write down your ideas, and if you need to, draw a flowchart. So flowcharts basically are graphical representations of, say, a loop. Say you had to go around five times in the loop. Then you could draw it out like this. Um, if you needed to do uh, an else statement uh, or a conditional statement with, uh, with a yes or no response to it, you can draw that too. In a lot of these cases, these statements uh, are trivial if you've got a very simple question. But when they get more and more complicated, having these maps, these flowcharts, can help when you've got one loop inside of another loop inside of another loop inside of another loop, um, or multiple if-else statements. So let's get started with uh, that first sentence, which is effectively writing a script that will. This effectively means that you need to use the MATLAB editor. All right, so we want to generate a random integer. This is the next part of the question. Generate a random integer in the range from two to five. So when this happens, the th you know, you see something like this, use Google, Google's awesome, and type into Google random integer MATLAB, and uh, a web page will show up, or a web page with answers will show up. And these answers um, can be really, really revealing. So I type it into random integer MATLAB, hit enter, and the first link that comes up, and it's often the first link, sometimes it's not, but often it's the first link, you click on it, and what you'll see is that um, this is the help page that you need to get this fragment of the question done. Here we see r is equal to rand i 10 minus 10, 1 and 1000. Okay, this statement right here is the key of what you need. It's in here, it's in this uh, example right here. Now what does the r at the beginning mean? It means that's the output. Um, and so you're going to put the output of rand i for a range of minus 10 to 10 from 1 to 1000. Um, to to put it into R. Here we've put it in, and you can see that there are a thousand responses that come back. I put it in again, and this time I'm going to ask for ten responses, or five responses. Let's try five, okay? So we've got five responses, so it's one row, five columns. I hit enter, and look at what happens. I get five random numbers from minus ten to plus ten in that range that come up. If I did it again, I would get a different set of numbers that would show up as well. Okay, and there we go. I now have a different set of numbers. Now, in our case, we needed to have one number that comes out, but we can see that this rand i function can work on multiple numbers. So if I wanted one number, 
I do 1 and 1 at the end. And here I get minus 2 as an answer. I hit it again, minus 1. Then I get 10. Then I get 2. Um, if I change my range, 2 to 5, 5, 3, 4, 5, 2, depending on how much coffee the computer had in the morning, then you would get different answers that would come out in the end. Okay? So, so it's a random number generator. It works. And, and so this is the, the key thing that we need to know about. If I just put uh, rand i251 and just left it like that, it would give me a scalar value um, between 2 and 5 randomly chosen. More explicitly, I say one row and one column with a range of 2 to 5, and that will be assigned to a, um, a variable like my random number. Okay, um, put a semicolon at the end, and even with that semicolon, it will be assigned to my random num. Um, I can change that, uh, that variable name if I want to, but let's move on to the next part. So it was generate a random integer in the range from 2 to 5. It's one random integer, a random integer, that's important, and I want to loop the number of times that is stated by that random, random integer. Okay, so I want to be able to loop a number of times. Sometimes it'll be three times, sometimes it'll be five times, sometimes it'll be four times. It's random, and it's chosen by the rand i function. But I know that I'm going to need a for loop because it's going to go a fixed number of times based on that random output. And it will start with four, it will end at end, and that number is going to be um, assigned by, the number of loops is going to be assigned by that variable my random num. So I say 4 is equal to i from 1 in increments of 1 up to my random number or my random num. I think I spelled it wrong here. Um, but that's basically what I have to do for my for loop. Now inside of my for loop I need to, uh, inside of it, we don't need to know about the details on the outside, I need to do something inside and that is to prompt the user for a number. So again, I type into Google MATLAB prompt user and up will come a help page. Um, sometimes it's a help page, an official one. Sometimes it's, it's a different kind of page, but Google's really good at finding the really relevant answers. So MATLAB prompt user, and I get uh, some information about the input function. And the input function um, will ask a user for some information and it will allow for that information that was given by the user um, to be sent to a variable, okay? And you can see that in that page that's highlighted right there. It talks a little bit about it in there. Um, but that'll go inside of that rectangle right there. So I want the, um, the user to input a value and I want it to be assigned to some value, some variable. So new number, that's the variable that I want it assigned to is equal to input and then I put the thing that will uh, that the user will read okay so I number question mark with uh, single quotes around it and so that will prompt the user to enter a number and I put a semicolon at the end that's okay it will assign the value to new number and that's really the core of what I need to have in that for loop after that I need to print the sum of numbers entered thus far so that means sort of inside of the for loop to one decimal point or with one decimal place. Each of those components right there is important. So I'm gonna type into, into Google, uh, MATLAB print to command window decimal places, a bunch of keywords. And in one of the pages that results, one of the first ones that comes up, there will actually be uh, some, good, uh, some good information. In this case, we don't want to use the disp function. It's not powerful enough. It doesn't have enough flexibility to it. In those uh, pages that come up, there'll be some discussion about fprintf. And fprintf is a much more flexible, a little bit more complicated, uh, a printing function or print to screen function. So here we say fprintf, open parentheses, open quote, the sum of numbers, colon, so that's text that the user will see. And then I need to have some formatting that only gives a single decimal place, that is for a floating point or um, fractional kind of number, okay? And so I put in percent sign, and that means like format to the to MATLAB. So format 0 0.1. Don't worry about the zero. It can be a bunch of numbers, but zero is fine for right now. Then it's 
then it's uh, 0 0.1 with um, the 0 0.1 meaning one decimal place. The F means floating point. I put the end, the closing um, quotation mark there, comma. And then after that, I put the name of the variable that will contain the value for the summation. So sum number, and I close the parenthesis. I put a little semicolon there. Okay, so I know that there's gonna be some variable that will be modified inside of the loop called sum number. It will be displayed to the screen to one decimal place. So inside of the for loop, what I need to do is I have to have this input function that I talked about earlier. Okay, and that will request from the user um, the information on the uh, on each cycle, how many, what what number to be added to the summation. So that will be new number is equal to input. And I'm going to ask the user for um, a number question, like it's a question asking them for a number, it's a prompt, okay? And I want that new number to inform the summation that comes afterwards. So sum number is equal to sum number, so it's the new version of sum number is equal to the old version of sum number plus the new number. This is how we do summations in, in programming uh, inside of loops. And then after that, I want the value to be printed to the screen, so f printf, the uh, sum of these numbers, okay, up to now basically, is going to be percent sign 0.1f. Close the quote, comma, and then sum number, which is the variable that we want printed to the screen. And this right here is the core of what's gonna be inside of that for loop. But it's not quite done because we need to initialize things. So above that for loop, what we need to do is say new number is equal to zero. And then we put sum number is equal to zero. And in both of those cases, what we're doing is we are initializing each of those numbers to zero. We're starting them off with a, a as a blank slate, basically. Okay, so we initialize those two numbers, then we go into our for loop, and then we, we set up the for loop with the index equal to na 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 na, uh, based on that, um, that uh, randomization earlier that we talked about, okay? But number one is what's inside of the for loop, two is the initialization. That's, those are the two important points right there. Okay, then after that, write the whole thing down on paper, okay? So we start off at the very beginning, and we say that we want our number of uh, loops to be equal to the output of the rand i function with a range of two to five, and we want one value, so one column, one, one row, one column. Okay, that's what that means right there. Then we initialize our sum number uh, to zero, and I put a cross or a bar through that uh, O to distinguish it from the letter O. That's how I, I signify zeros. You'll, you'll often see it like that. Then we say new number is also equal to zero, so we're initializing these two values. Okay, so we, we're initializing near the top of the screen just before the for loop. Then we put in our for loop, so for, so index is equal to one. So we start at an index of one, we go in increments of one, and then we go up to the number of loops that was defined by the rand i function from before that occurred earlier. We bracket it, we do for and end, so we have our beginning and end points of the for loop. Then we say new number is equal to input from the user, and we're gonna ask the user for a number. We say, give me a number or something like that. Then we close the quote, we close the parenthesis, we do the semicolon, so we end it. And now we need to do a summation based on the total value of numbers, sum, a, sum number, the old one. We add it to the value that was just given by the user, and then we store it in sum number. So we're effectively updating uh, sum number. Then we're gonna print that to the screen. So f printf, the current value or the current sum is, um, then it's, with a colon and then zero, sorry, percent sign 0 0.1 F, close the quote, comma, and then sum number. So we are going to output to the screen the value that was summed right there. Now, that's the core of what we need to do. Um, we can add to it if we need to, but that's basically what we need to do. So the next thing we do is we take that text that we wrote up and we type it into MATLAB. Okay, so we do, you know, start at the very beginning, number of loops, etc., etc. But, you know, this is like a, like a cooking show, right? So in a cooking show, they always do the cooking ahead of time to save time on the screen, so, or on, on TV. So what I've done here is I've actually typed it out ahead of time. Let's run this. 
And I've even put an extra little line at the end that says the final summation is 0.1f. Okay, so let's run it using the run button. And, um, but before I do that, I want to clear that command window to make it nice and clean. So I hit run. It asks me to give me a number. I put the number three in. It then uh, asks for some more numbers. I put four and then three, and then you add three, four, and three together, and that gives 10. So the answer itself is right. And if we look, you can see that the workspace variables have the right values in there, but we can also run this a little bit differently, okay? So um, we, can, we can run this again and see if it gives the same sort of result. So clear all, just make sure everything is nice and, and clean. And uh, so all the variables have been reinitialized, okay? We can run it over a couple of times, but let's say it's not working properly. Well, what we can do then is we can use something called breakpoints. And breakpoints are effectively stop signs for the program. They allow the program to stop or pause in the middle of execution. And you do this breakpoint by clicking on those little dashes beside the line numbers. And if I hit run, the program runs like normal until it gets to the line with that stop sign. So I type in the, the, the number that I needed to, then it hits the line where the summation is supposed to happen. There's a breakpoint there, so it stops. The breakpoint itself is also signified by that letter K in the command window. And that green arrow tells us we are currently on line eight. We're about to execute it. We haven't executed it yet. We're about to. We also see if we roll the cursor over the variables, it'll tell you what the variable values are initially. So the first time through the loop, some number will be equal to zero because that's what it was initialized to. And then it will be, it will have new number added to it. You can also see those values in the workspace. Okay, so we paused it. New number will be added to zero, which is four plus zero. And so what you should see in that workspace after we continue, so the continue button is clicked, you should see it eventually update. Okay, so we say this is the current sum, four, give me another number. So we've gone through the top of the loop again. Click on that. We've gotten back to the breakpoint, and now you can see that the workspace has been updated one more time. Sum number is now up to four. It's still four, and new number is one. So now one and four will be added together, and it will give a value of five in a moment. Okay, I have to click on continue. It gets asked for, give me a number. I need to put in another number. So new number will get updated there. In this case, I'll just choose one. Um, but now you can see that some number has been updated to five. You can see it in the workspace. And as the, we do the cursor rollover, new number will be one that will be added on. So the next value will be six. So the sum number should add up to six in a moment. Okay. You see it on the screen right there, but we haven't updated sort of internally. Um, so what we need to do is uh, we add in another number. We're gonna get to that breakpoint, and sure enough, at that point when the breakpoint has been hit, some num number has been updated. It's now six. New number is two, and the next value for some number will be eight the next time we go through it. So it is eight. That's great. Now we're gonna ask for another number from the user. It turns out that uh, number of loops is five, so we have to go through five different numbers. So we get another one. We're gonna add three in there. Okay, we hit the breakpoint one more time. We see that the old value of some number is eight. We're gonna add three to it. That'll make a value of 11. Okay, and there you go. It was 11. It displays on the screen as 11. The final sum is 11. And if you look in, this, in the workspace, it's also 11. So using breakpoints allows you to verify the value of variables, especially when you're looping and things get really, really complicated and hairy. Um, it can be a, a way to make things slow down and stop, and that's a really good thing.